Good morning, everybody. I have 1045. Hello, hello. My name is Ann Craig, and I'm the director of CARLI, the Consortium of Academic and Research Libraries in Illinois. And I'd like to ask my fellow speakers to introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Lisa Hinchliffe. I'm the coordinator for Information Literacy Services at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and co-PI on the Carly Jones uh, grant project. Hi, I'm Kimberly Shattuck. I'm Assistant Dean for user, user Services and Outreach at Illinois Institute of Technology. Um, it's a member library of Carly, and I was a participant in the project. Hi, I'm Stephanie Davis-Call. I'm Collections and Scholarly Communications Librarian at Illinois Wesleyan University. We're also a member institution, and I was also a participant in the project. Okay, so today, you are along for the ride on Carly Counts. This is our three-year Institute of Museum and Library Services, Laura Bush, 21st Century Grant, Librarian Grant Program Grant. Um, it's a little bit under $250,000. So a little context first. What is CARLI, the Consortium of Academic and Research Libraries in Illinois? Well, first and foremost, we are a membership organization, and we are also a unit of the University of Illinois system. So we are University of Illinois system employees, and my 24 staff and I, um, we provide uh, services that can be delivered at scale for our 130 members. And our 130 members include all public universities in Illinois, all community colleges, their, their libraries, uh, 68 private colleges and universities, and then we have eight special research libraries that are uh, contributing to education and research in Illinois. These are like the Newberry, the Chicago History Museum, the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library, that kind of thing. So that's who we are together. Our members serve, we estimate about 90% of the students, faculty, and staff in Illinois. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> so it's this rich diversity that has promoted a culture of doing things together and uh, doing things in a cooperative and uh, consulting way, I would say, with each other. I, I especially value our values, and in terms of this project, you will see dun, 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 that advocacy is listed as one of our values. These I love because I feel like they really speak to what I see in my employees and our members and our board every day. Another little piece of context, um, <coughs> not sure how many of you know about the state of Illinois' 26-month budget impasse. Ugh. It was uh, more than two years without funding, and it really uh, devastated uh, many state agencies and also higher ed. Higher ed in Illinois is still recovering uh, from this, this catastrophe. That's the way I, I think of it. And uh, our materials budgets, our personnel lines, everything in libraries was incredibly adversely affected, as you can imagine. In terms of this project, though, I think it pointed to all of us that many of us were not ready with compelling impact statements. And we certainly weren't ready with how we should cut, how we could cut, what we could do to cope with this uh, situation. So I will turn it over to Lisa. <coughs> So um, the program that we developed, which we've called Carly Counts, is what I'll talk about now, which is our grant on advocacy and analytics for working within our consortium to work towards being able to um, prepare better 
so hopefully we won't ever see two years without a budget again. Um, but also just to be in more of that advocacy role. So Carly Counts, as Anne mentioned, was an IM is funded by IMLS, um, which um, allowed us to put forward this program, which has the goal of building our Illinois academic librarians being able to effectively and systematically leverage national and local data in order to communicate impact narratives that convey to stakeholders that libraries are important for student learning and success. So in many ways, there is a lot of data out there on this fact that academic libraries are important for student learning and success, but we're not always leveraging that, and then we're not always putting that in conversation with local data. So through the grant program, um, we received a grant for almost a quarter million dollars over a three-year time period. So we began our work in October of 2018, and we are essentially uh, one year into the three-year program. It's a continuing education library leadership immersion program, meaning that individuals from libraries are coming together in order to build their skills over the course of over a year and do a project at their own institution while they're receiving support, training, professional development, community of practice, things that help them not just go, I mean, it's great to go to a pre-conference at a conference like Charleston, but I think you all and I have many three ring binders sitting on our shelves, right? Where we got trained in how to do something, but we never managed to implement it. So our goal here is to really support this implementation. In applying for this grant, Carly had two partner organizations in applying to IMLS, myself from the University of Illinois um, Library, and then Dennis Creeb, who is at Lewis and Clark Community College and has done a fair number of uh, studies at his own institution using learning analytics. And so he's important for bringing some real expertise here. So myself, this really draws on work that I was doing when I was president of the Association of College and Research Libraries in 2010-2011, when we kicked off the Value of Academic Libraries project. And some of you may have read this report. Um, any of the documents that I put up on the screen here are freely available for download. Um, from the website. So when ACRL, when I was president, when we commissioned this report on the value of academic libraries, we made it freely available, not just to members, but to the entire community, because we felt that was important for leveraging academic libraries in general, able to show the impact that we're having. This project really came out of a quote in some ways. This is our touchstone quote from Sarah Pritchard back in 1996, where she said, few libraries exist in a vacuum accountable only to themselves. There is always a larger context for assessing library quality, and that context is, how well does the library contribute to achieving the overall goals of the parent constituencies? For Carly, in our membership organization, there are research libraries, such as the one that I work at, where our mission, of course, also includes faculty research. Um, but across Carly, what we all have in common is that all of these academic libraries need to support student learning and success. So we focus Carly Counts on that particular aspect because it was common across our organization. Fast forward then, almost 10 years, and we also have um, simultaneously um, a program that Anne developed within Illinois. I'm not sure why I'm describing this, but I'm going to go ahead. <laughs> um, I lead, which was um, funded by IMLS, which was a team-based leadership development program for all types of librarians within the state of Illinois, which ran successfully for many, many years. It had a team-based approach where each team also had a mentor and it had this sustained immersion design. In ACRL, we had also continued the work and we had done a project called Assessment in Action, which had developed a curriculum for teaching librarians how to do this kind of work. It also had an immersion structure, but slightly different. So we took primarily the curriculum from Assessment in Action, the um, program design from iLead, and the needs of our Carly Consortium in order to design Carly Counts. So two very specific operational objectives, that librarians are prepared to make effective use of the research findings of the impact on academic libraries on student learning and success. So when we first did the Value of Academic Libraries report in 2010, what we mostly documented is we didn't have a lot of research on this topic. By the time we get to 2018, we actually have a lot of research on this topic. 
but what we observe is it's not always able to be leveraged. Getting it from the research literature into policy and advocacy is not a simple step. And so we really address that. But then we also realize that libraries need to put that national findings, that research finding, in conversation with local data analytics in order to really tell the story on that campus. So we don't all have to do the research that first-year library instruction helps students succeed in college. We know that now from lots of research. But what we do need to be able to do is put that national finding in conversation with our local practice in order to help our administrators, our funders, our boards, whoever, see that this work is based in, in evidence and here's the way we're pursuing it. We also know from various studies that we've done that part of what we need to do is really help librarians become more confident. So it's not just the cognitive and the skills of data and doing the research, but that they have confidence that they're doing it well and that they can make the case for their institution. So overall, obviously what we want is Carly libraries to be better equipped to demonstrate their value to their stakeholders. So, how across these three years we'll have about 100 of our 130 Car 30 Carly members that will be impacted directly, participating in the teams, in the research projects, and the like. The result will be a portfolio of local case studies. So we'll have about, um, of these Hardly Carly members, some of them are mentors, so they're not doing projects, but we'll have at least um, 80 case studies where a library has taken national data, they've done some work locally, and they've presented it to their institution. So we're really building a case study repository. And then each team is also developing a poster that represents their learning as a team. And if you were here when we started, we had a PowerPoint that was kind of flashing through them, and we also brought two physical copies with us uh, here today that you can take a look at if you want. The idea is then also that we're having an evaluation be done and so our grant has actually a heavy funding in it to evaluate this program because we're interested in the idea of how does this have collective wide statewide impact so in the national programs that ACRL did we did 200 institutions but across the whole nation so it didn't have that kind of concentrated effect one of the things we want to test out in this is if you do this at the state level can you actually change the conversation, not just at each individual institution, but in the state overall? We're hoping. <laughs> and then, of course, our goal is, if it all works, as we believe it will, and hopefully we'll have evidence it does, we will then be also sharing this out as an open resource um, that other states and regions could draw upon as the training curriculum. Um, and possibly looking at future grants that might enable us to partner with other groups in order to um, replicate this in other states. And part of the reason we think that might work is because I lead did that very successfully and has been replicated in other states as well. So each person, um, as part of the training we did together, um, we, we created a little Mad Lib for them to describe their campus project. This is just an example of the kind of immersive curriculum materials that we developed. So this is what they were working from, where they really started to articulate. And um, we have Kimberly and Stephanie to tell you about their projects today, so I'm not going to go into too much detail about that. But these are the concepts that were undergirding our curriculum. I've already talked about some of them, like collective impact, um, but we also are drawing upon theory of change, um, ideas of evidence and advocacy, evidence-based decision-making, evidence-based advocacy, and then overarching, building a community of practice within Illinois. So one of the things we're very aware of is we're going to have wonderful graduates from Carly Counts, but this is not a one-time like a vaccine. It's more like becoming part of a process and a part of a community that will continue to be fostered and nurtured over time. So what is the experience of being in Carly Counts? You attend two immersive workshops, one in February and one in January. And these are about two and a half, two and three quarter days um, total. We start with dinner and some fun activities and then um, some very intensive days of learning, practicing, etc. In between our immersive workshops, we have webinars on various topics, some of them dictated by the organizers and some in response to community member requests. 
The design involves that each team will have a team meeting on a monthly basis led by the team mentors. And then at our Carly annual meeting of our consortium, which happens in November, the teams will do their posters as a poster session presentation. So that's coming up in just a week, two yes. weeks, something like that. And then in January or February, each participant will submit their case study. And they already have the outline for what needs to be in that, but many of them are in the process of still doing their project. Our evaluation program, as I mentioned, is very robust. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Anne to share about that. For evaluation, because we knew we'd need to talk about how does this matter, we turned to the evaluator for assessment and action, Karen Brown from Dominican University. Uh, Karen's wonderful. She's doing all kinds of things like uh, pre and post surveys and telephone interviews with our mentors. And you can see all of the different places that she's pulling that how does it matter question out of. So this is really wonderful and we feel will give us some uh, traction for continuing this effort after the grant has ended. What is the program design, you may ask? Well, our program design is that the grant pays for two cohorts, one in 2019 and one in 2020. The 2019 cohort is getting toward the end of its work, uh, and then we will start, uh, we have started accepting applications for the 2020 cohort. In each cohort, there are six teams of five, and each team has a mentor. So the grant pays for 36 people per cohort for a total of touching 72 Carly members total. However, when we sent out the application announcement for the 2019 cohort, we got an avalanche of applications. It was great. And I'll have to say that Lisa and I, when we put together the grant, we were like, oh, we're going to have a party. Is anybody going to come? <laughs> but let me tell you, people showed up, didn't they, Lisa? They did. So um, the thought of turning away that many people from the first cohort as consortium director, it just made me, mm, like, we can't do this. Is there a way we can fit all of the people who applied into the, into the cohort and so the Carly board said, yes, we don't want to turn anyone away who wants to participate. So the board supported this project with additional funding. And the funding, uh, if we need it, for the next cohort will be there as well. We also were concerned that, oh, we were going to get only one of our member types to apply. We recognize three main member types, community colleges, public universities, and private colleges and universities. As you can tell, we got great representation from all three populations, and that was really a wonderful thing. In case you're wondering, who are your members, Anne? Well, these are where the participants from cohort one came from little weird grammar going on there, but you get the idea. And then the mentors are listed in blue. So we have mentors from Heartland Community College, ICC, Monmouth, so on. So you can see from this list, we had not only community colleges, but big research universities, small private universities, public universities all across the state, north, south, east, west. The participation, uh, we wanted the application to be from the library. We wanted to put our stake in the ground that the application has to come from the library. We, we didn't want this to be, oh, this is Kimberly's project, or this is Stephanie's project. This is ITT's project, or IWU's project. It is their organization's project. So. The library applies, and their application, if we had to turn people away, we would decide based on the strength of the narrative. And the narrative says, why do you want to come to Carly Counts? What, do you, what does your library want to get out of it? As well as, 
geographic diversity and member type diversity. So once the library gets word that yes, you're coming to Carly Counts, they select the person in their organization to attend. We tell, as Lisa was saying, we tell the participants that this is like a grant to their library. We want to seat this expertise in their organization so that we can grow this culture of learning, of, of using data, and building your stakeholder, um, your impact statement to your stakeholders from the, the evidence that you find. So that's where we were going with that. And now to talk about impact, Kimber. Um, so I have two slides. Could you advance? Sure. Thank you. Okay, so my project, so Kimberly Shaddock, Illinois Institute of Technology. Uh, we are a sort of medium-sized STEM school with a heavy uh, graduate population, um, international population, and uh, because of that, it's been a decreasing international population because of international politics. We're not getting the visas that the students are getting the visas that they were. So like everyone else, our budgets are declining. Um, one of those budgets, important one for me um, in user <coughs> services, is our student worker budget has been on the decline um, while minimum wage has been increasing. So we are you know, having to do more with fewer students who really run the library. We're open 24 hours. So it's been a problem for us. So my project was, uh, the purpose of the project was to demonstrate the impact of student employment in the library on retention, GPA, graduation rate, and persistence, so on student success. So does working in the library increase the student success? And then, next slide. Um, I'm still working on the data, so I'm, I'm waiting for the data and to account for uh, some, some things. I'm just looking at Pell Grant recipients. Um, and I'm happy to talk about what I find out once I find it out. Uh, but we're not there yet. So what I do want to talk about is uh, the benefit that I've received, even without the data. Um, it's really been a sort of micro community of practice. Uh, this, is, this is our group here. And we, ha we email each other constantly, not just about the project, but about job opportunities. Um, some of us are. It's really a diverse group. Some of us were part-time. We have one non-librarian in the group. Um, so talking about, hey, I need data on this. Has anyone read an interesting article? Or, um, you know, again, jobs, that kind of thing. Uh, so this like little support community. Um, also, it's given me a chance to, to focus on an actual project, and a formal project. I do a lot of informal assessment, um, but this was honestly my first time going through IRB, and this was having the space and the tools and, and the project to be able to actually formalize that and go through that process. Okay, on to you. Hi, I'm Stephanie davis Call from Illinois Wesleyan University. Uh, we're a small private liberal arts college with four professional schools, nursing, art, theater, and music. Um, we're also a predominantly white institution, um, and so my uh, we have a lot of conversations on campus about diversity, um, equity, and inclusion. Um, so at let's see, last spring, last fall, fall 2018. Thank you. Um, we were tasked with developing a diversity action plan. Every single unit on campus, from fiscal plan to departments to everybody on campus and so when Carly Counts came up I thought this is a great way to connect these dots um, this is also a great way for me to begin a relationship with our diversity our office of diversity and inclusion which is a new outreach relationship for me um, and I was on sabbatical in the spring which was great because I could really devote some time and headspace to this um, this whole project which was a huge gift um, so the purpose of my project is to explore how use of our library space um, positively contributes to our students of color, sophomores, juniors, and seniors, sense of belonging on campus. So sense of belonging can mean different things to different people. So one of the things on my survey is asking the students how they define that. That's an open-ended question. 
Um, so sense of belonging can impact a lot of different things. It can impact retention, it can impact GPA, it can impact engagement in a lot of different ways. So this to me was a great way to start the conversation in the library about how we um, contribute to our students of color experience on campus. Um, I should also say that in the spring, I, when I attended ACRL, and Kelly Broughton from, I don't know if I'm saying her last name right, but um, from of the Ohio State University did a presentation um, about belonging and the library space. So the, her bibliography was absolutely amazing and I drew a lot of great knowledge from her work. So um, I wanted to cite her. Um, and as you can imagine, Illinois Wesley University with 1,630 students, the Ohio State University, massive campus. So um, I thought looking at this from a liberal arts college perspective, um, especially in a time when we are really fighting for students, um, our enrollment is taking a hit and will continue to take a hit with some other things going on in student affairs. Um, so um, survey just went out and it was a great way for me to connect with our Office of Diversity and Inclusion, Institutional Research, we have a new director. Um, so this is a really great way, as I said, to connect a lot of different dots. Um, I wanted to, <coughs> excuse me, return briefly to the outcomes for Carly Counts, um, particularly the confidence and skill building. Um, it was interesting because I went into a lot of my meetings kind of saying like, okay, I want to do this thing, and here's my draft, and what do you guys think? Because I'm new to this. And the generosity and feedback I got was just great. So it was one of those things where I'm like, I don't have to know everything. I can go in with a lot of questions, and people will welcome that. And people will help me because they see the value of what we're doing. And so even though I don't have a final report yet, I don't have a formal thing to give people, the process of going out and asking for help and communicating that the library wants to um, explore and talk to students, excuse me, <coughs> um, is, a, is an implicit way of de demonstrating our value. And so even though it's not a formalized thing quite yet, and won't be until I turn in my case study, um, then uh, the relationships and networking that I've done on campus has already reaped great benefits. So I will stop there. And I'm happy to answer questions after about my survey. So thanks. So what's next, you may be asking yourselves? Well, we, we set out to design a project that Carly members could really <coughs> use, that it was useful in service development and in advocacy. And we, we were very intentional about this being something that could grow in each institution that participated. We were also very intentional that we wanted this to be a statewide push, that we wanted Illinois to think about how do we matter? How do our libraries matter? So we, we have members now who can point to projects that make these impact narratives with their stakeholders and they can start to shape services using evidence and skills they've learned in this project. And I have to say, as someone who works for the consortium, this idea of building a Carly community is fantastic. That we all feel more engaged with each other. I see you guys shaking your heads. I, it's, it's so important in a membership organization uh, to have that constant um, coming together and collaborating it, it so strengthens everything we do in so many different areas. Now, at, we're, we're starting to think about, okay, what after the grant? What after the grant? How can we keep this going? How can we 
keep getting traction. And one of the things that the board is talking about is could we find a project or a couple of projects that maybe everybody in the state could do at the same time so that we have a statewide, here's how we matter in fill in the blank. And the board, my board, is really, really, really excited about this thought. Um, we're, we're, we're building toward that as a, a next step. And of course, our evaluations and the people who've participated in the two cohorts will inform that process tremendously. So here's where we are. If you'd like to send us some, uh, some feedback, some, some comments, we'd love to, to see that. And I'm going to turn it back to Lisa. So this is an opportunity for questions, discussion, dialogue um, for people that might have either about the individual projects or about the, the uh, project overall. And our contact information up here as well. And we did just put these slides on the, the conference website. So they're out there for you. I have a question for you who did the study about the student workers. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, did you already get through IRB, or are you working on it? I went through IRB, and they decided that we were exempt. Oh, exempt? Yes. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Okay. So, so I'm just working with um, historical IPEDS data, basically. Oh, uh, yeah. okay, okay. And, and looking yeah. at the persistence rates, GPAs of a specific narrow subset of, of people who worked in the library um, during a certain period who were Pell Grant recipients, and then comparing that to the student workers who did not work in the library who were Pell Grant recipients. Nice, I see. That's really good. I, was, and, I, was gonna, I was thinking that yeah. if, you, if, if you were trying to do that research on your own employees, you'd have trouble getting through IRB. Oh, right. But uh, I, I know I was on an IRB and I would have rejected that if you were doing research on your own when people were currently working with you. But, so what we find across almost all of Carly counts, and then I can say for the National Assessment in Action, um, pretty much all library assessment projects have come through as either exempt, which of course, for those of you not familiar with the language, that actually means exempt from full review. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't mean exempt from any review, but exempt <coughs> from the full review process. Um, what, has what has varied some is the degree to which um, levels of consent and how much consent has been required. So whether consent has been required in an implicit way, in a very explicit way. Um, we also have a number of places where they have said, the IRB has said, you are doing program management evaluation work and we do not consider that to be research. And because it is not research, it is therefore not subject to the Human Subjects Review Board. We also have a number of our members within Carly, Carly that are small institutions. They actually don't have IRBs because they don't do research with federal dollars, which is what requires you to have an IRB. So in Carly Counts, we actually start from the premise that you need to treat humans ethically, and then you also have to do whatever documentation is required. And so we don't take the approach of saying our ethics are determined by our procedures, but that we have our ethics and we need to attend to those and then we also have our obligations to our institutions. So some people have decided before they've even gotten to IRB, no, I'm not comfortable ethically with this approach. Um, so we first do the ethics check, then we do the documentation and approvals check. And I think that's very important, particularly for us as librarians in our field and we really spend a lot of time in Carly Counts talking about our privacy values, confidentiality, anonymity, which are values from our profession that also come into play with IRB, but you may or may not have an IRB that is gonna check on you. And IRBs also vary quite a bit in what they demand and, and, and the way certain things are seen in context. And so we wanna ground ourselves in our ethics is one of our really firm statements. And I want to just mention that we have hundreds of student employees, so the, the N is 100, in the hundreds, and um, 
it was all de-identifiable data. So just wanted to put that out there. Yeah. So you're working with it without identifying. Right. Yeah. I'm sure these projects will, you know, all intensely learn from each other. Yeah. But I was completely struck with you when you gave your two you know, Illinois and IIT, Illinois Wesley and IIT, because all I could think about was, you know, do the student workers at Illinois Wesleyan welcome the underrepresented groups on the campus because students really want to be accepted by other students, I think, and that has a, and then when you're talking about IIT, I was thinking about, okay, well, how diverse are the student workers at IIT? <laughs> and it just seemed to me that these projects are going to be so intertwined between what they might learn from each other. Yeah, you might, you know, want to partner up in the future. Well, it just, you know, and the, the whole idea of studying student workers and their, their really integral role in modern academic libraries is just off the charts. It's very important, I think. I mean, not the least of which with companies like mine like to hire them. So. <laughs> and I do want to be clear, if I find out that our student workers aren't doing as well, that's an opportunity for me to develop some more programming to, yeah. to you know, and we do some, some outreach and some programming with our student workers, but you know, I would like to do more. So this is, you know, also to improve our own programs as well as make the case for more funding. That sort of connects to one of the questions I had, which was to what extent um, do you, did you guys get feedback about your projects? You know, you can have a question, but then sometimes you need feedback and help. So what's the role of the cohort in helping you sort of frame your project? And then how are the cohorts actually built? Like, are they cross types? Are they regionally based? Um, and how do you decide who's going to be the mentor? <laughs> so the cohorts were based, um, we did actually do them uh, geographically within the state of Illinois um, because we had the thought that maybe they would have their monthly meetings in person. One group did that. The other groups did not. They chose to use a, a telephone. Um, it was the group in Chicago. Right? <laughs> so like, um, and if you can do that, do that because yeah. that really helped yeah. our group. I think. Yeah. Um, we actually had a separate process for choosing the mentors. So the mentors were selected from librarians within the state of Illinois who had either participated in iLEAD or assessment in action. So we have alumni of these two programs in our state and so we use them as sort of like we have these, I want to say experts, but we have experienced people who experienced either the curriculum or the immersive program before. And so we, we went to them directly and asked them to participate in this mentorship role and then also got their library directors to, in the, a couple of our mentors are directors, but um, those who are not, we wanted to make sure that, I mean, again, we're asking libraries to commit to this. So if you're having a mentor commit to being part of this, um, there is some professional development benefits for the mentor and next year there will be even more and we have a consultant who works with us on, um, her name is Beck Tent, on uh, personal development and so we're going to be even adding a little bit more for the mentors on personal development for them as a lead. Are they connected, the leaders, the mentors? They, uh, the, the mentors across the cohorts, is there a mechanism for connecting them? Yep, there is a mentors group. They get a phone call every month, too. <laughs> Honestly, you really like, you're probably going to hear from Lisa and Ann way more than you want to. <laughs> I mean, in addition, I actually have one to one conversations with every participant in the program, and next year we'll actually do that twice, is what we decided. Um, so now I want to have you talk about the experience of being in the cohort and you know, your peer to peer part. Yeah, I think the feedback is really built into, especially the in person <laughs> sessions. You. I mean, it's, it's in the worksheets, basically. It's built in, and then those one-on-one -on -one sessions are, are basically feedback sessions. So I would say, you know, and our group was really close because we met in person, um, and the poster is all about just group dynamics, really. Um, and so for us, it was, it was constant. And I mean, it's, it's really powerful to throw out an idea to a group of people who, uh, their, their job is to like give you feedback and ask questions and kind of be like, so what do you mean by that? Or how do you think your students will react to that? So it was a really great built-in mechanism. And as Kimberly said, the time is built in for that. And you kind of go in knowing like, that's your job. So you do it and it, it really worked out well. 
You've been trying to ask a question. <laughs> uh, just very quickly, uh, with so many different libraries and institutions that have different missions, uh, did that create any challenges with cooperation, or were there things that you wanted to do that you weren't able to because of kind of the differences between the institutions? So, one of the goals of getting the grant was to really eliminate barriers to participation, which we know our small libraries often have. I mean, if you're at the University of Illinois, we go up to conferences fairly easily, um, and it's built into our structure. Um, so we, the grant is covering all on-site expenses of being at the hotel, all meals. So the only expense for the institution is the travel to Champaign-Urbana, which is relatively small. And um, we even have structured the timing of the program so people coming from Chicago or from Southern Illinois could get the right trains. <laughs> like that's our style. <laughs> Just trying to sort of like really think through what are the things? Now we can't help the fact that you are going to have to be away from your library and obviously being away from your library for a two-person library is a bigger ask. Um, but we really realized that to really have that statewide impact we needed to bring the program to the people because very few people are able to go to the programs when they're on the national level. It's just way too expensive to, for a small community college to send somebody, even to the ACRL conference for five days, registration, hotel, travel. So this is about as inexpensive as you can get. So that was our main thing that we could do. I think the fact that we're all focused on student learning is really helping a lot. The other thing I would say is I would not assume that just because people are at big institutions, they're more confident about this. So sometimes we have those senses, right? Like um, I think the chance to learn together um, and because we do already actually know each other, that's another interesting dynamic compared to, I have a lot of comparisons, right, because I ran the national program and I ran, like in the national program we like met each other for the first time, right, partly, I won't say everyone knows everyone, but everyone already knew somebody, and that makes a really different dynamic. Also, we're all going to keep working together, and in the national program when it was done, everyone scattered back. So I think that's partially what the collective impact is going to be able to have. You want to talk a little bit too about how there was concern at first that someone would have to, someone participating would have to have a level of knowledge. Oh yes. <laughs> when we first did the early <coughs> annual meeting last year, the, the pitch like, hey, you want to apply, like every single person was like, I'm not sure if I know enough yet. I, so basically I started for like 15 minutes saying, you really don't have to know anything. No, you really don't have to know anything. Are you interested in this? Then you know enough. Like, right. <laughs> like it was really, so I, I guess it was effective because we ended yeah. up with so many more applicants. Yeah, um, yeah. and the, the curriculum provides a framework <coughs> and it provides a lot about vocabulary and gives a lot of different examples of assessment projects. And that's actually one of the things that you're meant to go out and do is explore the case studies from assessment and action, explore project outcome for academic libraries. So a lot of that is baked into the curriculum and, and the things that you're doing within your group. I'm wondering, are these librarians in this project mostly uh, faculty librarians who are required to do research for tenure and promotion, or are they mostly not faculty, and you are the ones that are getting them into doing research at all? Yes. I think it's a mix, but most, I would say the majority of them are, so I want to, because you actually combine two things, they're faculty who are required to do research. So I would say most, a majority of them have faculty status, but that doesn't mean they're required to do research because all of, pretty much all the librarians and community colleges in Illinois, for example, are faculty. Um, but community college faculty don't have a research requirement. So like that's why I had to unbundle that a little bit. I so. would say only one person in my group has faculty status and it's not she's not on your track faculty. We even had a non librarian and a part time librarian, but these were institutions where the director said, Hey, this is important, you go do it. Mm -hmm. So that yeah. was so what they're, was important. They're, so they're doing this in order to promote libraries at their institution. Yep. Uh, defend the, the library. Right. To have impact narratives, I mean, it's it's both to defend in cases of budget, but it's also mm -hmm. to ask, mm -hmm. right? Once we find a program that's working really well for these hundred people who are in it, 
maybe we should do it for the 200 people who aren't in it, right? And so we're going to make an ask with that. So I, I think it can be a little demoralizing sometimes to always have our thought that we're defending what we already have or what we're in danger. This is actually also about either reallocation or about making an ask, saying, you know, this institution, we're concerned about our students of color and they seem to be leaving us. And if you can say, well, you know what, the ones who connect with the library are, you know, they look like they're more likely to get that connection, that's going to get somebody's attention. And, um, you know, you find yourself in these new conversations. So, you want to ask something? Kind of following up on that, I'm curious about curating the, the findings and the data. Mm -hmm. um, does that live at the consortium level, or do individual libraries are responsible for maintaining that data and sharing? So we'll, each individual library will be writing up a case study, okay. and that will be maintained by the consortium. Okay. Um, and in a preservation mode, we'll also be putting it into the institutional repository at the University of Illinois, just because for the University of Illinois, we think about preserving things forever. <laughs> so they will all get there. Um, the curriculum, when it was, is also released, will be on the consortium site, also preserved, and that curriculum will be released with a CC license, so it can be reused. So. Um, so I am aware that we are over our time. Um, I hope some of you will come up maybe and look at the posters. They're really great. The teams have great creativity. We'll also be putting those posters online um, with the rest of the materials as well. So thanks so much.